Am I recording something? I am. Hello, this is Shane Phillips, and today we've got a special episode of the Housing Voice podcast. This interview features work from some of our very own UCLA urban planning faculty, including our guests, Professors Pavo Monkinen and Mike Manville. As those of you up to date on your housing Twitter may have already guessed, Mike and Pavo are also the inspiration for this special musical introduction from Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney. If that makes no sense to you, I don't blame you. You can follow the Twitter link in our show notes to get up to speed, but it will probably raise more questions than it answers. What we're talking about today is primarily two surveys of LA County renters that took place over the past year, asking about job losses, late, partial, or non-payment of rent, eviction threats and filings, and other challenges that tenants have endured during the pandemic. While the surveys and this conversation focus on Los Angeles, I want to be clear that I think almost everything we discuss applies to the rest of the country as well. The positive impact of the eviction moratorium for tenants the scattershot response of rent relief, and just the overwhelming weight of uncertainty, especially for lower income households and households of color, is certainly not unique to LA or California. As the expiration of the eviction moratoriums have been up in the air, and states have struggled to distribute rent relief to those who really need it, this was a timely conversation, and it was great to have the foundation of real tenant survey data, not just speculation, to work with. The Housing Voice Podcast, as always, is a production of the UCLA Lewis Center for Regional Policy Studies. Be sure to subscribe to the show if you haven't already, and never stop telling your friends about us. We really appreciate it. Mike Manville and Pavo Monkinen are with us this week to talk about some research they've been working on. Mike and Pavo have co-hosted the show before, but today they are my guests. So along with their co-authors, Mike Lenz, also from UCLA, and Richard Green from USC, they published two reports over the past year or so, each of which surveys 1,000 renter households in the county to understand how they've been weathering the pandemic and its economic shocks. Before we get into the results of these studies, we do want to thank the groups who have provided financial support to make this research possible. That's the California Community Foundation, the UCLA Luskin Institute on Inequality and Democracy, the Luskin School of Public Affairs, the Zyman Center for Real Estate, and the UCLA, or, uh-oh, the U- USC Lusk Center for Real Estate. We're just going to take credit for that one too. Mike, I think you can get us started here, and uh, I'll ask you a simple question and a more complicated one. So just to start off, why are we specifically interested in renters? Why is that the interest here? And then the, the more complicated one, what do we not already know from other surveys, other data that's been collected over the past year and a half on renters and how they've been dealing with the pandemic? Yeah, those are great questions. I think the one reason we think about renters when, you know, when the, when the pandemic got started, there was a lot of concern, a lot of concern about renters. And one reason for that is just that there was a concern in general about low-income people and how they would weather the economic hardship of the pandemic. And one of the biggest, usually the biggest expense that low-income people face uh, is their rent, right? So so part of it is just the composition of renters uh, strongly overlaps with poverty, low income, income precarity, and so forth. And so, you know, one way to think about it is that it's not the case that, that most renters are poor, uh, but it is the case that most poor people rent. And so if you're worried about mm-hmm. low-income people because of an economic shock, you're worried about the situations they face, um, one way to, th- to to examine that is that their biggest expense usually is the rent they have to pay. On top of that is that there's something about renting that lends itself to a little bit more instability, which is that we have in the United States a few more protections for homeowners who get in trouble. Right. Uh, the most obvious one, and, and it's not necessarily a protection, is that there's a there's a, a fairly large chunk of homeowners at, at this point in the United States who actually own their home free and clear. Uh, and so mm-hmm. if they lose their income, that's a struggle, but the roof over their head isn't threatened. 
Um, there obviously by definition, there's no renters who enjoy that particular protection. But on top of that, you can get some, it's easier in general, and this varies, of course, a little bit from place to place. It's easier in general to get forbearance on your housing payment. Uh, if you are a homeowner, it is in general harder for a bank to come take your home than it is for a landlord to come evict you, right? And so you have a, this this aspect of the tenure itself that makes makes you know that made us and makes us still concerned about what was happening to renters when. Uh, particularly when the sort of lockdowns and, and economic contractions started. And so that that was one of the impetuses for our, our first survey, and then, of course, the follow-up survey, too. And the second one was that the, the U.S. Census sort of did something very unusual when the pandemic began, which it abandoned its very longstanding pattern of being uh, very slow and deliberative. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the census uh, creates a lot of extremely useful data products and usually does so on a very slow timeline, right? Because they, they put a huge priority and they do a very good job. They put a huge priority on making sure they have good samples, making sure that they're, they're delivering accurate data, imputing missing data and so forth. But to their great credit, when the pandemic began, they started doing a, a survey every other week and sometimes mm -hmm. weekly that they called the pulse. And that was very different uh, and the Pulse did provide, it basically just tried to provide a weekly snapshot of how households were coping with the pandemic and its fallout. And one of the most useful things it did was it did ask people how they were doing with their housing payments. And so we first sort of looked at that and the Pulse, uh, the, the, the two issues that we confronted with the Pulse that were, were we considered limits were that the initially, and the Pulse has changed its wording a few times over the course of the pandemic, but initially, it asked a sort of ambiguous question about whether a household was up to date on its rent. They just said, um, I, I forget the exact wording now, but it's sort of like, is this month's rent or housing payment late? Mm -hmm. And so late is, of course, a little bit different than you're not going to pay at all or you can't pay and things like that. And if you if you had like been late two months ago, but you, you were caught up, you would be considered up to date and maybe would report that wouldn't come across as ever having paid anything late. Yeah. So there's, there's a few different layers of ambiguity. So one, of course, is just like, you know, maybe it's June. You missed May's payment entirely, but you're up to date on the current month. And mm -hmm. so you say, yeah, actually, I paid for this month. Yeah. And you would the, the pulse wouldn't pick up that this person was carrying a rent debt. The other issue is just that uh, if you got called by the census surveyor the second week of of the month and you hadn't paid yet, but you were pretty sure you were going to pay five days later and you did, well, then you're down as late, which is legitimately, that's a sign of renter distress, but it's, a, it's sort of a different level of distress than the whole month goes by and you haven't paid in full or maybe you haven't paid at all. And so all of that's, that nuance sort of got lost. Um, and again, like I do not hold this at all against the Census Bureau. They deployed very quickly a survey to capture a lot of people. The other thing that, that they were uh, the other sort of a couple of the other things that they were missing is that if someone did report that they uh, hadn't paid rent, they never they never asked how much their rent was. So you you couldn't really know um, how much money they owed. You know they asked they asked people's income, and you can make some inferences based on that. But uh, so so we sort of looked over Pulse data and then decided that we would try to design our own survey for renters in LA County that would complement the pulse and get at some of these questions. And so we were really interested in, you know, nailing down what kind of building do you live in? Who is your landlord? How much rent do you pay? You know, in this month and in the last month, you know, very specifically, did you pay late? Uh, did you just pay part of your rent? Did you miss your rent entirely? Um, what happened after you didn't pay? That's something the Pulse also wasn't able to get a hold of. So it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, did your landlord offer you a repayment plan? Did your landlord threaten you? Things like that. Did the landlord say they were going to evict you? And so uh, what we did, uh, just to, to sum it up, and of course we can talk about this in more detail, is just looking at sort of the some of the, the holes in the housing part of the Pulse, we tried to ask a bunch of questions that would uh, flesh that out so we would have a, a better picture of, of exactly how much renters were struggling, in what form they were struggling, and then what was happening as a result of that. Right. And so 
Pavo, I'll turn this to you. You have two rounds of surveys now, um, the first of which took place in July 2020, and the second took place in March 2021, more recently. Both asked renters roughly 45 questions or so on things like job and income losses, non-payment or late payment of rent, eviction threats or eviction filings, um, basic demographic questions, things like that. Starting with how the pandemic affected renters' employment, what did you find? I guess we can start with the March 2021, the more recent survey, and just kind of tell us what was in that and and maybe how um, it had evolved from the July 2020 survey. Sure. Yeah, I think, and broadly speaking, I think I would just add to what Mike was saying about kind of the motivation of this work, especially given that this is a housing research podcast, is that, you know, our original survey was motivated by uh, effort between USC and UCLA and some foundations to do this kind of report on the pandemic affecting uh, the region and kind of what could be done. It was a more policy directed kind of effort. And then our follow up survey, I mean, in part because we found some interesting results from mm-hmm. our first survey, um, we thought we would continue it, you know, both for this policy relevant focus, but also kind of as an area of research. I think, you know, the behavior of landlords and tenants. Uh, you know, especially among the most vulnerable tenants and kind of perhaps the most what could be char- what people might dispute being characterized as vulnerable landlords um, is an area that has traditionally been understudied, I think, by housing scholars. You know, mm-hmm. obviously Desmond's work on evictions kind of blew up that specific kind of relationship between a landlord and a tenant. But I think there's a lot more there that we don't know about kind of strategies and how people deal yeah, with yeah. hardship and what landlords do in response to different tenant behaviors. So I think that kind of from a more basic research perspective, like an explanatory research perspective, this is also kind of relevant work. You know, there's a lot of assumptions out there about different kinds of landlords and different kinds of tenants that we found some of them to be uh, less true. But we did confirm, you know, kind of a lot of expectations and, you know, things were very bad in our first survey. Uh, they were still very bad in our second survey. You know, in the in the surprise, yeah. I mean, in the they, they were bad. I was going to say they were bad in a different way, right? So bad for maybe different people, and kind of raise some questions about how kind of this progressed. And it's you know really mm-hmm. unfortunate this couldn't have been kind of a parallel effort with some long term kind of following of different kinds of people because these snapshots give us one sense of what's happening, but often raise more questions um, than answers that we'll get into. But yeah, I mean, you know, so. Over a third of our respondents uh, lost their job. Another twenty percent ish lost work or income. Um, you know, and of of people that are reporting some form of these kind of employment problems, sixty percent reported some form of problems making rent, be it paying late, paying partially, or not paying at all. So, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a tough picture of uh, the condition of renters. And just to uh, just to put that into some context, you know, one of the things we confronted was that there aren't really good pre-COVID baseline estimates of how often, you know, how how timely rent is, you know, and uh, I think the the best comparison we found is you can look at the 2017 and 2019 American Housing Survey. They asked about a couple months of rent payment. And if you look at those for the Los Angeles metropolitan area, um, everybody's paying their rent. It's, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you're talking about well over 95%, mm. uh, up, upwards 97% of people that are, by the end of the month, getting their rent in, and very small numbers of people who would report being more than two months behind on rent. Okay. Um, and in our survey, you know, those numbers are like tripling. And how about evictions and eviction filings? I think, you know, important context here that pretty much this whole time there's been an eviction moratorium. And so I know there were quite a few eviction threats and eviction filings. Like how, what were those numbers and and why was that even happening? What's going on there? Yeah. I mean, I mean, before that, right. With the renter distress numbers, you know, in our first survey, we saw people that were paid rent partially at least once during the three month period, it was 15% of respondents in our second survey. It was 30% of respondents. Um, Also people that paid late, late, uh, went jumped up from 21 to 28. So there's kind of more problems with payment during the second wave. Um, just mm-hmm. focused things on are, that specific things are getting worse. Yeah. Three month period. Yeah. And so right, uh, threats of eviction went up a lot, and uh, eviction filings went up a lot. 
the numbers are from you know 15% in the first wave to 25% in the second wave of our respondents experiencing a threat of eviction, you know, of respondents that had problems making rent. Mm -hmm. um, and then evictions initiated went up from six ish percent to about 20% almost during the second wave. And I think we, you know, the, the context here, you know, as Shane alludes to is that there was a mortor moratorium. There was, there was at different times, there was the, the county moratorium, there was the state's moratorium, and of course, the CDC moratorium. So when, when our respondents report a, a threat or a filing, especially a filing, you know, it's, it's unclear to us exactly what happened, mm -hmm. right? It's possible that, you know, a, a landlord could, even during the moratorium, go down to the courthouse and actually file the eviction. And what the moratorium in general prevented was anyone acting on right. that. So it's possible that that happened. It's also possible that what's being reported is just an elevated threat, mm -hmm. right? Like the landlord says, you know, first they say, if you don't pay, I'm going to evict you. And that, you know, they would answer our survey and say, okay, we, I've been threatened with eviction. Uh, but then they come back a week later and say, you know what, like, I did it. I pulled the papers. I, I'm, I'm going to evict you. And how's the tenant going to know? Right. right. So, so you know, because they, they may... Even the courts barely know because they're not actually processing these things right now. Exactly. And so so it's it's possible that that's being reported as just a, an escalated level of threat. But it's certainly whatever is going on, it's it's being perceived by the tenant as something more than just... Hey, you know, if you don't pay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take steps to get you out of mm -hmm. here. And then on because this is a fairly big survey, you know, it's an, a large enough sample. You can break this down by race and ethnicity. How do things look, um, you know, for different groups here? Yeah, so that was one of the things that that changed a bit between the waves. And we'll get into kind of the the second survey may have some, you know, the component composition of the sample might be a little bit different from the first survey. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so in, in the first wave, um, we saw, you know, kind of uh, Asian and white households um, with reporting 12% partial payment of rents, uh, where black and Hispanic households were reporting 22 and 19% of partial payment of rent. So big difference there. And the, the percentage points and the kind of level of difference changed a lot in the second sample. Actually, you know, his black households reported 33% not partial payment within the, one of the three previous months. But Asian households reported 37%. Mm -hmm. uh, white households reported 25%. And Hispanic households reported 30%. So kind of a narrowing of the distance between kind of incidents of problems paying rent. And yeah, so was, that was a surprising result. And also we'll talk about kind of back rent owed by, by race later. And that's also uh, further, further different results than expected. And, and as you can imagine, especially in the first survey, that the, the the race and ethnicity breakdowns were highly correlated with income mm -hmm. you know, and job that, loss that are, and, in yeah. general. Yeah. In, in general, our, the, the white and Asian renters were um, higher income, a little less likely to have lost their job, a little less likely to have reported lost income. Uh, and that of course, so it all becomes sort of overdetermined and all that adds up to uh, a hard, harder time making rent payments. Yeah. It is very interesting though, how from wave one to wave two, you know, for black and Hispanic households, it was roughly like a 50% increase. So from 20 ish to 30 ish percent in both cases, mm -hmm. um, who had, who had, uh, this was for paying rent late, right? Uh, partial payment. Yeah. Yeah. But for Asian households, it was from 12 to 37. So it was a, you know, 200% increase. Yep. And for white, it was 12 to 25. So like a 100% increase. So that mm -hmm. was certainly interesting. Yeah, and that, that, that will correlate with our next surprising finding, probably. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of surprising stuff in here. I think one of the, the ones that stood out to me was the results for what kinds of landlords were more likely to threaten or file evictions. So I think most people would expect that it'd be the bigger corporate landlords. These are the guys who have the, the worst reputation, uh, that they would be worse, that they're less lenient than mom and pops or family and friend type landlords, uh, more likely, more quickly to resort to eviction. But that's not what you found here. So can you share uh, those results and, and maybe your thoughts on why those don't align with that intuition? Yeah. So, I mean, we, we found uh, essentially the, um, the opposite of what you just said, uh, the conventional wisdom might be. And I think that is, in fact, the conventional wisdom that the renters who were behind on payments who were most likely to get an eviction threat and most likely to get an eviction filing were people who rented from families and friends. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, that was, uh, I, I forget the exact numbers, but they were probably, you know, about 20, 25% of our sample and, uh, you know, about 30% of the, the people who were, who were threatened with eviction. After that, you saw, and it was a pretty steep drop off, um, into the people who just rented from some mom and pop landlord. And then the, the least likely to be hit with some sort of eviction threat or filing were people who rented from a, a big management company, an LLC, a, a, a corporate landlord. And so, you know, why that may be the case you know, is a, there's probably a couple of different reasons. So one, and this is this isn't the explanation, but I think it's probably important to to point out for one thing, is just that if you think that the corporate landlords are are operating bigger buildings that just have higher rents, mm-hmm. then they may also just have higher income renters, mm. yeah. and so the chances of them having a tenant who has trouble paying might be lower. Yeah. Right. So just just from the beginning, if you're a there's a big difference between someone working at, uh, you know, a a car wash or working at a a fast food restaurant and renting from their uncle or renting from some mom and pop landlord. The pandemic comes and they're out of work. Mm -hmm. Right. As opposed to some recent college graduates, they work for an accounting firm downtown. They pay higher rent. They rent from a corporate landlord. The pandemic comes and they just go to Zoom. So right off the bat, you might just have less non-payment in these buildings. Now, the thing is, our results are conditional on non-payment. Pablo's making weird faces. We, we can't that, keep it straight I, So face I here. was thinking through this this morning, and I, and I looked, and actually in our sample, uh, slightly higher incomes in the friends and family tenants than the individual landlords. And also the, so that's the opposite of like, in terms of income breakdown on average, it's the opposite. Is that right? Of what, okay. Of what you so all, yeah, all of our surprising. intuitions are wrong. Everything is, we have no idea what, yeah. what to expect. I mean, I think, um, you know, and there might be some issues with who we're sampling and also who we think of as, as larger landlords, right? Cause if you think of like fancy companies, you know, you think uh, companies are all luxury new buildings, but in fact, companies do run a lot of lower uh, costs. Yeah. Rental house and I think Mike is getting at the point that even if the even if we were right about the incomes of these households, this is not the explanatory thing either yeah. way. So, so, so that yeah. So, regardless of whether that intuition is correct, and apparently in our sample it isn't, which surprises me a little bit. <laughs> but but Pavo's looked at it more recently than me. the The thing is that this is you know even controlling for not paying. What we're seeing is that these bigger buildings are less likely. Um, to file an eviction. And and I think that's, it's surprising, but it's also, if you look at what we know about who evicts so far, you know, if you look out over the literature, a lot of it relies on eviction data, Mm -hmm. right? So you look at studies of um, what kind of landlords are doing evicting in this metropolitan area, that metropolitan area, this big city, and so forth. The the data that's drawn from, because it's the only data we usually have is the eviction filings themselves, right? Which is that answers the question of who actually, you know, when someone is going to eviction court, what sort of building do they live in? Uh, what that, what you don't see though, is the question that we're sort of able to answer with our survey, at least for Los Angeles County in the last year or so, which is if you don't pay, you know, what kind of building are you most likely to be evicted from? Right. And if you just have a situation where, lots of people happen to live in a particular kind of building, then the rate at which non-payers are evicted can be pretty low. And yet you can still have most people being evicted, being evicted from those buildings. Mm -hmm. So what we do, you know, and and I don't... This is why in some cases, the public housing authority is the largest evictor in a region. Yeah, it's a huge evictor, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of people with precarious incomes happening to live in very large buildings. Uh, even though a lot of public housing authorities do take, you know, eviction is really considered a sort of last right, step. There, right. Right. Um, they, they will really work with a lot of people before they have to, they feel like they have to evict them. And so I, I think something like that might be going on here. And then the question, of course, is like, well, why is it that the big landlords uh, are able to sort of exercise that forbearance? And, you know, then you just kind of get into speculation about, well, maybe they, uh, it's they're better able through their reserves to carry a couple of non-paying tenants. Um, it may be that, you know, a, a really small landlord or a, a, especially a family or friend, uh, 
just feels like they can't, you know, make the mortgage mm-hmm. without getting someone out and finding. And I think this is, you know, Pavel mentioned earlier that we, we embarked on this very much for the, the policy issue. You know, we wanted to see how the renters in LA County were doing it. Um, but if you wanted to look at this from a research perspective, and this is one of the things we know very little about, which is that the, the, the interaction uh, between landlords and tenants when it becomes obvious that someone isn't going to be able to pay, mm-hmm. right? That, that there has been some stuff written in the housing, the owner-occupied housing literature after uh, 2008 about sort of strategic interactions between people who owe mortgages and, and banks and so forth. And it's reasonable to think that some sort of similar game theory plays out between a tenant who realizes they're not going to be able to pay and uh, a landlord, right? Which is to say, like, okay, you know, I'm a tenant. I realize I'm going to come up short. Um, What happens if I don't deliver that check? And you might reasonably think if I'm renting from my brother or my mom or my cousin, they'll be cool, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to... Uh, uh, so I can, perhaps I can take not. some of that. Yeah. And, and perhaps <laughs> you might be you're wrong. And perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps you're wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, and you might think that if it's, you know, a faceless LLC, you really have to get them the check. And so you might see that that person, you know, they they're more likely to pay the faceless LLC and maybe skimp on some other expenses, whether it's food or what have you. And the reverse might happen with uh, the renting with the family members. But, you know, what we see in our survey is that the, the family members are much more likely uh, to pull the trigger and try and get someone out mm-hmm. um, than the LLCs are. And, and I don't, you know, I probably should chime in. I don't think we have like a really coherent explanation for why that's the case. Yeah, I mean, especially the, the dramatic, I mean, you know, among renters with distress, 38% of those renting from family friends reported being threatened with eviction <laughs> and not only 9% of those renting from a company, right? So it's like four, yeah, that's a huge difference. Four times as much. It's, it's impressive. Yeah, and you know, I mean, it's there. There might be a sense in which the big companies, in addition to to feeling like they can do it, you know, that they can carry it. You know, if you've got forty tenants in your building and there's a couple of them not paying, you're like, okay, we can get through this in a way that a smaller landlord can't. They may also uh, just feel like they're they're going to come in for more scrutiny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think there's a, and there's a you know those both point to less of that action on the part of big companies and you know there's the question of kind of rents like efficiency rents perhaps being charged in the case of you know friends and family might be charging less than market rents to be nice and then that might lead them to be more likely to to want to get some yeah i mean i think you know it's if you i was for unrelated reasons a couple days ago on uh blackstone's homepage, and of course (laughs) nobody gets worse publicity than blackstone and the, the first thing on there real estate page is just like since the pandemic began we have not evicted anyone and we won't mm. right and, and so that's it's the company that is you know for good we reason, uh, we will not sec- do this thing that is illegal <laughs> yeah well so good commitment <laughs> yes right i mean that's yeah. that's something that stood out to me about this is like you know you would think that the corporate landlords would probably be most aware that there is an amor- a moratorium and what, you know, the rules actually right. say and that, right. you know, filing or threatening an eviction doesn't really have any force behind it. So I guess that could partly explain why they're not bothering with, with threatening. But I get, and, and also maybe because the, mo- the mom and pops don't need good PR because apparently everybody already loves them. Uh, yeah. And the, well, the, yeah. The everyone loves the mom and pop landlord. <laughs> and I think there's a certain amount of, you know, yeah, there's like, obviously, there's this cynicism, especially right now in, in Blackstone saying, like, we haven't evicted anyone. It's like, well, you haven't been able to, you know, in, in, <laughs> but, you know, they, they were making that claim even when they weren't covered, right? I mean, mm. this was, they, they, this is a company that has justifiably gotten a lot of bad press. And so they're sort of pouncing on, on this. But if you think about a mom and pop or a family and friend, the, the incentives might be lined up better to, to actually do this in the sense that, like, you know, whatever, your ne'er-do-well nephew is like, you know, missing the rent. And you just go over there and you're like, you know what? Get out, Jimmy. <laughs> and he says, there's an eviction moratorium. It's like, what? Yeah, I raised you from a pup. Just get out. You know I mean? It's just, you can do it a little bit more informally. Um, you can do it under the radar. And and if as Pavo is saying, which might be well the case, you're just, you're not trying to, if you're that landlord, you're not trying to maximize yeah. your rent. 
Uh, you're not hitting the quarterly. You're just trying to get yourself some cash for this extra room to cover the mortgage. You might think you have a better chance of filling that unit. Mm-hmm. Right. And then once the right. talk of rental assistance came into play, I think it was it was probably even easier for the bigger companies to think, oh, we're going to be able to get some of that. You know, and so in our data, we, we saw that looking at kind of back rent owed, there's more of it owed to the company. Like, so the, the ratio of back rent to rent for tenants renting from big companies is higher than for the other categories of landlord. And so they, they are owed more money and they're still, uh, you know, threatening people less, but they probably know that they'll be able to navigate the bureaucracy to get repaid in a way that mom and pops probably maybe won't be able to and definitely don't want to probably. Yeah. Uh, one last thing I'll say, and you could you could frame this in a way where it does support these findings, is that bigger buildings have the potential for more networks between the tenants themselves and information sharing where, you know, there might be a bulletin board or something that says like, you know, you can't be evicted um, that someone puts up. And so the landlords knowing that, seeing that, whether they pull it down every time they see it or whatever, they know that it, the, the knowledge is out there and they might be more wary to try that tactic when they know that, you know, if, if you try to evict the person in unit 103, they have, you know, four friends in the building who are going to say, oh, they can't do anything about that. And so, you know, they, they might not even bother. Yeah. And I think, I think there's, there's a lot to that. And I think then it just, it sort of builds on itself to the point where maybe you were thinking about doing this, maybe not. You realize that it's going to be a long time before you can force a non-paying tenant out. And at that point, you might as well just try the, the, mm-hmm. the repayment plan. Right. If you, if you say if you say to someone, oh, you know what, I just walked down to the, the courthouse and filed an eviction on you. Um, and so sometime in the next seven months or whatever, some indeterminate long time horizon, you're going to be evicted. I, I don't think you as a landlord and you can be as mercenary and heartless a landlord as you can imagine. There's no upside mm-hmm. to that for you. Right. You just you're not going to get any of your money. Um, the person's going to be there for months. They They might damage your unit. Right. As, as time gets closer to when they're going to leave, um, you don't have to have a, a sort of a, the, a bleeding heart to say to yourself that given these circumstances, the much better thing for me to do is try and negotiate some sort of plan to get repayment. And then if you are a mercenary shark, you know, when the eviction moratorium gets lifted, then file yeah. for the eviction. So, so I think in many ways, the moratorium put in place a set of incentives that said, especially for the bigger buildings, they Mm -hmm. should just wait. Okay, I want to move on to another surprising result from the second survey in particular. And this is with regard to high income renters and how they responded to the pandemic, especially kind of as it as it wore on. Um, So in the first round, you found that high income renters were the least likely uh, between high, middle and low income renters to pay late, um, pay partial or to not pay rent at all at least once. But by the second wave, they ended up more likely than both middle and low income renters to pay only partial rent at least once, and almost as likely as low income renters to pay late at least once. So what is going on there? Yeah, no, this is something that um, really piqued our counterintuitive finding uh, sensors here and you mm-hmm. know um, got us thinking about more this kind of idea of strategy on the part of tenants in terms of, you know, tenants with higher incomes that for whom uh, leaving or having an eviction filed against them would be less troubling because they could easily find a new place. You know, Mm. they might be more likely to just kind of not pay on purpose, you know, and it got us worried about lower income households are kind of less resourced, less social capital, perhaps having households in terms of struggling to pay no matter what, right? So making rent first, kind of foregoing other household expenditures or borrowing money, et cetera, right. to pay rent. Whereas higher income households kind of maybe were more okay with waiting on rent because they felt more secure kind of generally. Yeah. So the the flipping of the correlation between income um, and problems paying was, was really striking, you know, and also with this idea of back rent, we didn't put it in this report yet, but we're, we're working on kind of a, a larger paper with this second uh, wave of survey data. You know, we find that the the median household that owes rent, uh, 
owes kind of 1.2 months of rent. So 120% mm -hmm. of a month of rent. Um, the highest income tercile, third of households, owes two months of rent. Oh, wow. And the lowest income tercile or third of households only owes one month of rent of those that owe, right? So they owe, they're much more likely to, to be late, uh, pay partially or not pay, but then also they owe more than the low income households. Yeah, and, and I, I guess we can sort of jump ahead here to policy a little bit because I think it relates directly to this. Something that I've heard about, you know, listening to other shows and reading things is how the ways that renters have been coping with a loss of income and how rent relief is actually being delivered aren't always mm -hmm. that compatible. And so, you know, what I have in mind here is how, as you said, a lot of tenants, maybe they're taking out a loan or borrowing money, foregoing other things they need in order to pay rent. And that seems maybe to be disproportionately true for, for lower income households. But the rent relief, as I understand it, is really only to relieve your rent, you know, your back mm -hmm. rent, if you have not yeah. paid your rent. Right. And so if you made the kind of selfish choice in a way, like it's a smart choice, I don't want to fault anyone for it. But like, if you if you kind of had a sense for for what the how the rules were set up, you might say, well, I'm not going to sacrifice anything to pay rent because maybe right. that will be covered versus the person who took out that loan or borrowed money now has a big credit card bill, um, but their rent's paid off. They're not eligible for anything. And so that seems like a really big problem to me. Yeah, I, I think, well, I completely agree. And I'm going to, I'm going to answer that, but also double back to something to what Pavo was saying earlier, just with a, a caveat, which is that you know, the, this surprising result about the high income renters, it's in the second survey and we've put out a brief based on the second survey, but we haven't really sort of examined it to the extent we examined our first one. Um, and one of the things that we should observe is that in the first survey, like almost everything we found, that, which was very reassuring, it correlated in all the right places with what the pulse was finding. Um, this one is mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. of a divergence that the pulse doesn't seem to record quite as big of an increase in, in being behind. And of course, the questioning is different. The question and this is, is this different. is the pulse, not for national, but for the LA metro area, which is not exactly the same as LA County, but there's a lot of overlap. Yes, there's there's some good reasons to think there would be some discrepancy because uh, the, the pulse metropolitan area is Los Angeles mm -hmm. and Orange counties. And in addition to adding, it adds a sort of, it adds 3 million extra people um, but most of the renters mm -hmm. are in LA County, right? So it can kind of throw proportions off when you, you're basically, what you're doing is you're kind of changing the denominator. That being said, right? So when we look at these, this result, you can think to yourself, well, there's two plausible things that could be going on. One is just that as time went on, even higher income people had some trouble, right? And we do know that that mm -hmm. happened to some extent. Uh, but the other thing is sort of what, what Pablo might have been alluding to and, and what you were alluding to in your question, which is that if you were to start to get strategic, if you if you were to think that some renters would become strategic as the moratorium continued and as it really wasn't clear what how we were going to sort out the yeah. question of the, the, the lack of clarity on how or if it was even going to be addressed was really, you know, I'm, I'm sure weighing on a lot of people. Yeah. And so if you had some people who thought, well, you know what, like maybe there will be generous assistance for anyone who's behind or maybe some rent will just be canceled the people most likely to be able to really capitalize on that paradoxically mm -hmm. are the higher income tenants right if, if you're a low income tenant that uncertainty is is just gonna well, and especially if you're it. requiring reams of paperwork as the original plan was <laughs> yeah and you know because your 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 income is lower it's precarious uh, you're not going to – the likelihood, despite what you sometimes hear from sort of like conservative uh, policymakers or things like that, the likelihood that that person's going to game mm -hmm. the system is quite low. Whereas if you're a high-income tenant, you might have a bunch of money in your savings account. You might have family who have some money. And so you might say to yourself, you know what? I'll withhold a little bit of rent, yeah. see if I can get away with it. And if I can't, well, then I'll, I'll just pull right, the money no out and pay. Mm -hmm. right? And no harm, no foul. And so – some of that might be going on. And I think this, this now brings back uh, to, to your question. Yeah, I think that one of the things that, that haunted the entire pandemic policy question about renting was it just was never entirely clear how we were going to help people. Yeah. Right. The moratorium went into place very quickly, and that was the right thing to do. 
And then for too long, it was kind of all we had. And so in that space, you had uh, both renters and mm-hmm. landlords, right? I mean, you know, we worry more about the renters, and I think for good reason, but both renters and landlords saying like, well, now what, right? Is someone going to help me pay? Uh, is all rent going to be just yeah. sort of forgiven? You know, is it, if you listen to some of the more radical voices, is it just going to be canceled or abolished? Or I think what was kind of on the table for a long time, which is it's all just going to kind of accrue and you have to pay it back within a year or something. Right. So you could have, you know, this would be a rare yeah. case, but ten or $15,000 in, in rent debt earning $30,000 a year. And you're just, there's there's no hope for that. But that was that was sort of the plan at never, one point. Right. And it gets converted yeah. to some other form of debt and you get a nice mm-hmm. repayment plan. But all of those, con- I mean, if you were following those conversations, which you were probably more likely to do if you were uh, well off and highly educated, right. then it seemed like something was going to happen. And so like it might be a better idea to to defer some payment. Yeah. And, and so I think that what happens is uh, if you if you're not following it or if you're if you're following it and you're at all risk averse right and i think someone who has very little money has to be quite risk averse this comes back to what shane was mentioning which is that well you know your your first dollar goes to yeah. your rent right you know you because it's very hard to handle anything else if you don't have a roof over your head right it, it's better to eat a little less it's better to skip some medicine it's better to uh you know wear your clothes till they're threadbare than to put yourself in a position where you and your family yeah. are out on the street. And so you end up paying the rent and that you might be doing that by borrowing some money from your family, by taking out a loan, um, by putting it on a credit card, by doing all these other things that can put you in, in, in all sorts of debt that aren't rent debt. Right. And that's a totally rational thing to do. And then, you know, a, a, as we said, what happens is, the state does come through in a, in a manner of speaking. And what it says is, oh, if you're behind on your rent, we'll pay you back for that. But only that. And only that. And of course, that's super important. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and one could certainly wish that this program was, was executed better. But it does leave, uh, and our, our survey suggests, a, a lot of families, a lot of households carrying some other form of high interest debt. Um, that they took on explicitly so they wouldn't fall behind with their landlords because they weren't sure what was going to happen. And there is no policy mechanism beyond the normal unemployment and whatever that we have going on uh, to help them get out of that. As someone who struggled (laughs) pretty heavily to pay rent from like age 17 to 25 or so, I can say I, I don't recall, I was certainly late on rent plenty of times, but like I don't ever recall thinking, rent is going to be anything but like the first thing I pay, you know, because you need a place to live. Um, why would why would that not come first? And, well, so- and especially in a in a place like L.A. where where rents are going up and, and most people's current rent is probably much lower than a similar unit would rent for on the market. Yeah. Right yeah. Now, right. So I think that's yeah, to lose a rent stabilized unit. You yeah. Know. I mean, even even a non rent stabilized unit is probably if you've been there for a while, it's probably mm-hmm. a better a better deal than you'd get. Not to mention moving. Man, the the discussion about this relief program really reminds me of the HAMP failure of post-2008 yeah. era and like the U.S. being right. just quite bad at programs directed at people <laughs> needing assistance quickly. I mean, to some extent, it's like, obviously, it's a challenging endeavor to, to start up a program anew in the face of crisis and all these things. But, but the kind of complicated structure that that program had leading to it not reaching most people that needed it uh, is eerily reminiscent of this one. Yeah. And I think we can blame the state to some extent for this, but probably the bulk of the blame should be laid with the Trump administration to be realistic here where they just didn't take it seriously. And it wasn't until very end of that presidency where, you know, things started to move forward. Um, I don't want to lay it all on that because I think a lot of people could have done better. Um, But when you don't have that federal support, which is where a lot of this rent relief money is coming from, and especially, you know, it turned out that the state had this big uh, budget surplus here in California, but 
we couldn't have foreseen that really and so we just didn't know if we would have the resources to yeah to but that i mean support. we'd failed to start a rental registry to even get good info on this on the people yeah, that yeah. needed the yeah money. so let's we failed to do a number of infra you know infrastructure changes that would have allowed it to happen quickly let's just talk about that a little bit to close this out um you came into this most interested in the policy questions so you know coming out of it I guess the the way I'll put this is, what have we mostly done right, and what have we what did we get wrong? Well, I mean, the moratorium was the right thing to do, and and I, you know, I I and I think it it is still the right thing to do. Although as as time goes on, right, uh, I understand arguments that we're relying too much on it, right? That something should have come with it, but the moratorium was absolutely the right thing to do. That there was there was public health and humanitarian and just like human decency reasons to make sure nobody just got ejected onto the street because essentially right, the government course. shut down the economy. Um, after that, uh, we started doing things. <laughs> Everything and, from then and, on. And yeah. I mean, I don't. It's like right, and it's it's just easy for me, like you know, Professor Egghead sitting at my table to say this, but it, you know, and it starts from some of the, what what Pavo alluded to, which is that we have. For too long, too many states, California included, although California is probably better than some, we have social welfare programs that are set up, you know, they're, they're sort of grudgingly set up. Like, they don't, they, you know, they're, they're not designed to be easy to use. And, you know, California is better than Florida. But what we saw is just like, even when money started flowing, it was just hard to get it out. It's hard to get it out because it's cumbersome and it's old and there's a certain amount, I'm sure, of bias built into it, which is that like this is a, a minority uh, numerically and probably, you know, disproportionately racial minorities who are going to access this system. So we've never really cared mm -hmm. that much about how well it works. And then there's, as always, this concern about uh, we have to make sure yeah. this doesn't go to the wrong people. You know, we got to triple check and you got to have this letter and this testament and so forth. And obviously fraud is bad. Yeah, the un the unemployment debacle didn't help matters for sure. Yeah. And the unemployment debacle didn't help. But this is a, a I think that our welfare systems in the United States have always erred too much on the side of like, we don't want a single loose dollar going to someone mm -hmm. who may not deserve it. And that's, you know, it's better for some people to not get money that they need than for others to get money they don't need basically like that's the calculus that's the ethos yeah. and it you i think that's to me uh quite arguable even in normal times yeah but yeah, i think that's wrong even even yeah you know with food stamps during non-pandemic times for example right. like especially it's because every just time important these... to make sure people have enough to eat even yes. if there's some waste you know um and yeah because because the, the government is going to waste some money and so if we're going to waste some money, I'd, I'd like to think we're wasting it just in an effort to be inclusive where people like having enough to eat than like, I don't know, the next drone strike or something. But the and this is especially the case when you have what's basically a national emergency where it's already been quite clear that money isn't much of an object. Right. Congress is allocating trillions of dollars. And right. so and, and the economy is losing billions of dollars a day. It's OK. Uh, if a few people pull in some rental assistance money that maybe didn't strictly relate to a job loss because of COVID-19. Well, and, and that's one thing about this, this counterintuitive finding about the, you know, higher income renters owing more right. money and such is like in our discussions about it, you know, the moral hazard is interesting from a kind of academic perspective, but it does, we don't want it to be our frontline kind of policy conclusion because it could easily mm. be mobilized to say, well, we shouldn't be doing this rental assistance program that's going to help disproportionately higher income renters. I mean, the, it's the, the problem is we're not helping the lower income renters, but like if we, if we're helping a few strategically minded higher income renters uh, and on accident, they're getting more than they quote unquote deserve. Then I think that's something I'm fine with. I mean, it's very much like the yeah. debates around the foreclosure crisis where it was like, we don't want to, we don't want to moral hazardly uh, reward those people that bought too big of a house and said, we'll do it to the banks. Um, I mean, right. we, we just want to reward the banks that recklessly <laughs> sold them derivatives. But I mean, that argument yeah. about like individual yeah. responsibility was, was mobilized so much back then that you could imagine it happening now. And in, in yeah. In a and you know, well. I mean, and it's again, 
it's not that policy targeting isn't important, right? Right. Like, I mean, there's 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 legitimate policy reasons for if you say you want to help low income renters, you know, making sure you get at low income renters. It's just that sometimes it gets carried to this point where any leakage at all is considered unacceptable, mm-hmm. and then because of that concern, you don't get at the the population you want to help. And I think. When we first started rental assistance, we had this sort of cumbersome process of, you know, you file paperwork and your landlord files paperwork, Mm -hmm. and then the government pays your landlord for you. And a lot of that was just to do this sort of double verification. Like, we all agree this person's behind. We all agree uh, that it's because of COVID. In, in on paper, maybe that looks good. But in the real world, that's a lot of transaction costs, especially for a household that's probably in some distress and it would have been much better to just like you know if you figure out there's a tenant who's behind give them some of that money well and i'm sure there's i don't know the the literature on administrative burden very well but i'm sure there's a strong correlation between affluence and ability to to make sure the paperwork lines up in the right way right so you would be leaving out the the worst off in that case i mean i think that even expanding the idea of the accrued rental debt relief to just payments to renters i don't i don't think it's part of the conversation but i think it should be yeah and and i think you know there there and i think most landlords do want to just be paid um but i i do think we should point out that there's been some evidence of landlords turning down Mm -hmm. the government assistance and that is uh plainly unfair right if the tenant qualifies for assistance and wants to pay you uh, as per the contract you <laughs> entered into with that tenant, um, you should have to accept that money. And I and I would not be surprised if a lot of what's going on there is that some of these tenants are longtime residents in rent stabilized apartments, right? Uh, and right. this is a way to decontrol that apartment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's basically you know I I couldn't get you to to sell out for five or ten thousand yeah. dollars, but I'll just eat this loss of rent, which amounts to the same thing, and and kick you out. And put yeah. this back on the market for 60, 70% more than you were paying. Yeah. And, and and doing that is worth it to me as a landlord. And that is not the purpose of a rent relief fund, right? <laughs> right. It's not to yeah. decontrol our rent stabilized housing stock. And so I know that people have been trying to get a fix on that, uh, but but that was going on a little too often earlier. And it really goes back to, I mean, the, the standard economist sort of approach to redistribution, which is just like, when you find the person who needs money, give them the money. They'll spend it, right? If, if you just handed some money to a, a person who is behind on their rent, they would pay their rent. And the added benefit is if that person had stayed up to date on rent uh, and done so by going into debt to uh, a payday lender or their credit card or whatever, they would pay that person, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you wouldn't punish them for doing what was the, the rational thing to try mm-hmm. and protect their household, which is to put the rent first. And and. It's it's a hard problem. I don't mean to like throw the state of California under the bus here uh, because yeah. we are talking. Not... You're probably increasing the cost of this tenfold to to take that approach to just give people all you know an equivalent amount of money. Um, so it's yeah, not would, it's would, not a it's not a small thing for sure. It's not a small thing. Uh, again, you know, I think we certainly could have afforded it. Um, it's not uh, it's not something we were set up to do, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're very accustomed, again, to this sort of paternalistic welfare state. So, so I understand why we didn't. But I also think it's important for everyone to understand that because we didn't, a lot of people who worked really hard and did the same sorts of things a lot of us would have done in that situation, mm-hmm. right? make sure first and foremost that we have a roof over our head, um, they're in debt and they're not getting as much help. Yeah. Well, I know we can wrap this up, but I know there are some other resources out there. So, of course, the Pulse survey has been going on. Um, is there anywhere else you want to point listeners to for other research that's been uh, been done on, yeah, on a, this subject? Yeah, there's a bunch of good studies out there. We can we mm-hmm. can put them in the in the show notes. Okay. Yeah, and I guess the one thing I'd say is that you know the a lot of the stuff we're trying to get at is a moving target you know, exactly how much money people owe in rent and things like that. And the estimates really vary. And so I would encourage anyone who reads our stuff to to read everyone else's too. Yeah, we didn't get into the total size of debt estimate. Which, which is, is which is good because right now we're, yeah, we're still trying to work we're still through figuring it out. I mean, I guess we should also uh, end with a grain of salt on this kind of woe if true 
finding about higher income households, um, I mean, it is one of those things that is, is quite counterintuitive and, and we want to dig in to make sure it's, it is what we're saying it is. What right. We think and it so, is with, and, and we can, we can use that grain of salt to, to work back to the, the point of our podcast, which is about housing research, which yeah. is to say that like right. renters as a population, um, we've always known. And now I think now Pavo and I and Mike and Richard are learning, you know, firsthand it's, they're hard to study. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, um, and so we, you know, we're doing our best and, and the pulse is trying and, uh, but this is a, a population and particularly when you're talking about a, the subsegment of that population that might be having a lot of economic troubles, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one of the obstacles to helping them is learning about their condition in a systematic way. So we're, we're trying, but it's, uh, it does introduce a lot of error into the process too. One more plug for the rental housing registry. Yeah. Yes. Although Fine. Los Angeles has one, the city, and did not seem to use it to any good purpose during the pandemic, as far as I could tell, unfortunately. Yeah, that's probably true. And we'll see. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, all eyes on the end of the month and what's going to happen and, you know, with what the courts are going to do with all the eviction cases. I mean, that's something that we've discussed, but don't really have any good sense of kind of how that's going to work, right? Yeah. This kind of fear of uh, a large number of evictions being filed and then what, what the bureaucracy will do with them all. All right, Mike and Pavo, thanks for coming back as guests today. Thanks. Thanks. As promised, in our show notes, you can find a few other studies and surveys on these topics of eviction and renter distress during the COVID-19 pandemic. And you can learn more about this and all our other episodes on our website at lewis.ucla.edu. The UCLA Lewis Center is on Facebook and Twitter. I'm on Twitter at Shane D. Phillips, and you can find Mike and Pavo there too. Thank you for listening. See you next time.